All right. Uh, thanks very much. It's great to uh, to have this whole panel uh, here that we can we can hear from. You know, in the Canadian context, it's always a special event when we can bring together a bunch of people from Montreal together with a bunch of people from Alberta. So hopefully, we'll forge national unity here. Um, we. Uh, I, I guess you know by, by way of introduction, you know, I'm, I'm given the, the scope here to, to say a couple of words of thanks. I mean, I'd like to just uh, thank CIFAR for you know all of these uh, three rounds of uh, fellows uh, announcements, which I think we all feel has done a lot for uh, AI research in Canada, and particularly for having the foresight to uh, also have the affiliates program beyond the three institutes, um, which uh, because our affiliations are being given as the three institutes might not be entirely obvious to those of you in the audience. Uh, who, who aren't uh, watching how the sausage is made here, but uh, those of us at uh, Waterloo and Dalhousie and Guelph and UBC and SFU uh, really uh, value these contributions as well. Um, and and it also, uh, I think we really would be remiss not to acknowledge the contributions that NSERC and uh, you know, other Canadian funding organizations throughout the years have made in support of AI research. So uh, it's great to see Canadian AI research um, you know, drawing a crowd like this. It's fantastic. Um, turning to our illustrious panel here, uh, it hasn't escaped my attention that this is the um, yet another panel uh, in the same format as a panel that you guys have seen before. So I'm going to do my best to just mix things up a little bit to keep it uh, interesting. So um, I'm going to begin by asking our panelists um, um, to introduce themselves as we've done before, and then I'll turn to some questions uh, in sort of the same vein that we've heard, but, uh, but maybe with a little bit of a different perspective. So uh, let's just uh, take it from the panelists in the order they're seated. Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Siva. I'm an assistant professor at uh, McGill University, and I will be part of Mila. I mainly work on uh, uh, building conversational, mod uh, conversational AI models for uh, different tasks, different devices, and different languages. Um, that's on the practical side, but on the theoretical side, I'm interested in uh, finding out what are the fundamental representations of language that facilitate building conversational models. Um, uh, and I'm also interested uh, in problems like uh, biases. Uh, when we build language models, what kind of biases creep into the models? And how does it have effect on conversational models? Thank you. Thanks. I am uh, Tim O'Donnell. Uh, I'm a uh, professor at McGill, also affiliated with Mila. Uh, I'm a little bit of uh, maybe uh, I have a different background than many people here today. I'm a, uh, a cognitive scientist and a linguist. My primary appointment's in the linguistics department at McGill. Um, and my PhD is actually in psychology. So I'm very interested in uh, computational models of cognition, uh, especially language cognition, although I've worked on other areas. Uh, most recently, I've been very interested in the problem of compositionality. So the fundamental feature of language is that it's a map from form to meaning uh, that's compositional meaning the meaning of wholes, like sentences, is built out of the meaning of the parts. And I've worked on uh, identifying the basic units there uh, on the form side, uh, in speech, in text, in sign, uh, and mapping those into semantic representations. So, yeah, Hi, everyone. I am Ashwarya Agrawal. I am currently a research scientist at DeepMind. Um, I graduated from Georgia Tech. Uh, earlier this year, and I'll be joining Mila in University of Montreal uh, next fall. Um, so speaking of research, my general interests are at the intersection of um, computer vision, natural language processing, and deep learning. But uh, more specifically, um, I'm interested in this problem called visual question answering, VQA, where basically the idea is that we want to build machines that can answer natural language questions about images. So for instance, I could take a picture of this room and ask what kind of event is this, how many people are here, and so on. Um, there are a variety of reasons why I'm interested in this particular problem um, from different perspectives. So A, it feels very natural to be uh, testing visual understanding of a system by asking questions in natural language, just as you would test a kid's understanding about a particular subject area. 
Uh, B, purely from an application point of view, uh, I think VQA can have useful applications such as uh, serving as an aid for visually impaired users. So they could ask questions like, uh, is it safe to cross this street? Uh, it could also be used for building interactive demos for children. So for example, they could ask, what animal is this? Where is this found? Um, and it could also be used uh, as interactive assistance for humans. And lastly, which is one of my favorites, is um, from a research point of view that this problem of VQA um, involves interesting research challenges, uh, the problem of visual recognition, natural language understanding, um, and understanding about common sense and knowledge bases. So I would like to give a very quick example just to um, highlight the degree of the challenges in the problem. So for instance, let's say the question is, what is the person in the blue shirt holding? And the machine is given a picture where there's a person in blue shirt holding something. Right? So it seems like a trivial question that a kid might be able to answer, but let's imagine what it takes for a machine to be able to get to the right answer. So A, it has to figure out the person in the blue shirt in the image. Uh, this is called the problem of language grounding. And then after that, it has to understand what it means by holding, that it needs to look at the object in the hands of the person. And hands are not even mentioned in the question. So that in some sense, this is common sense understanding. Um, and then once it, has, it is looking at the hands, it needs to identify that object, which is the problem of visual recognition. The story is not over yet. Uh, most of these models are trained on large data sets consisting of images, questions, and answers. But what if most of the uh, people tend to be holding briefcases in the data set? Then the machines tend to memorize that, oh, let's see, then let's say briefcase is the answer. So we need to train machines to overcome such kind of uh, biases. So yeah, that's why I'm interested in VQA. Um, hello. Can you hear me? OK. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Sarath Chandar. Uh, I'll be starting as an assistant professor at Polytechnic Montreal. And so I'll be associated with Mila. Um, I work in the intersection of deep learning, reinforcement learning, and natural language processing. Uh, some of the research questions that I'm interested in includes how can we design uh, algorithms which can model really long-term dependencies that arise in like various reinforcement learning and NLP <coughs> problems. Uh, this involves tackling challenges like vanishing and exploding gradients that, uh, that arise when you want to train architectures with really long sequences. Uh, I'm also interested in designing continual learning systems which um, like, would not have any catastrophic forgetting issues. Uh, and this includes research in the directions of how can we design modular neural architectures where uh, there is less interference between the modules, and how can we design memory augmented architectures which would uh, have a long-term memory which would help us remember things in a continual learning setting. Um, um, I'm also interested in multi-agent reinforcement learning. Hello, um, I'm Li Li Mo, and I'm a new assistant professor at the University of Alberta, also affiliated with Mila. Oh, sorry, <laughs> Amy. <laughs> okay, so we have too many Mila people, so oh, I'm actually from Amy. Sorry for that. Um, We're building bridges already. Okay. <laughs> well, okay. Um, so my research is mainly in natural language processing and. Uh, um, uh, with machine learning methods, and the long-term goal of NLP is, of course, teach a machine to understand and communicate with humans uh, using natural language. But um, the short-term short goal uh, of my research is sometimes um, natural language understanding uh, with a little bit symbolic reasoning. For example, uh, you do sentence classification, then you want to make sure where is the evidence, like which word, or maybe uh, in a paragraph, which sentence talks about some information. This is, this is a kind of a, you know, toy example of reasoning. Another example is maybe you also do sentence classification, then what is the synthetic structure of the sentence? So we know um, natural language has synthetic uh, structures, the syntax trees, but can the computer reason about the syntax tree by itself in an unsupervised way. So these are some um, symbolic reasoning or some um, reasoning parts underlying the understanding problem. And the techniques we use is typically reinforcement learning and other uh, relaxation for um, um, other kinds of relaxation for reinforcement learning. And the other part of my research is sentence generation uh, with applications like summarization or paraphrase generation or whatever. And uh, uh, we also use reinforcement learning and also searching algorithms to do that. Thank you. Yeah, so we're from Amy. Sorry.
<laughs> yeah, my name's Adam, and I am from Amy, and I'm going to stay there. Um, yeah, so I'm at Amy at the, and at the University of Alberta, and I'm also one of these really lucky people that has a split position, so I'm also at DeepMind Alberta as well. So get to mix the academic life and the industrial life, and it's really, really nice. Um, so I was going to tell you that I work on reinforcement learning, but CFIR has decided I wasn't on that panel, so I guess I'll do a switch up here and just do something else. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's already been mentioned I, I work on continual learning. Um, I also like to call it lifelong learning because I like to evoke the idea that an, an agent's actually learning from a lifetime experience, right? It's not this short horizon thing. It's not iterative attempts on games. There's just one trajectory that the agent gets to learn from. So things like you know, having multiple copies of the environment or building in a lot of domain knowledge, that might not be so successful. And so that immediately leads to research questions like you know, how do you represent knowledge in a learning system? How do, you, how do you build models of the world? How do you plan with those models? Especially when you, know, when you think about this problem setting, we often imagine that our, our learning agents are huge. They're massive, right? Like our tardy agents are way, way bigger than the game emulator. But in actuality, it's like the opposite of that, right? Like our agents are tiny. Our computational resources are tiny compared to the vastness of the learning problem. And so you have to start thinking about how do you deal with approximation? How do you plan with models that are going to be wrong, they're going to be inaccurate? And how do you build representations of the world, you know, especially dealing with these temporal effects that you need to remember, remember things way in the past? So usually I'm inspired by robotics, and every once in a while I'll go and, and do work in robotics and then get really frustrated and sad, and then I'll come back to algorithmic research. And I, and that's kind of a, a good pivot point to go back and forth, to touch reality, see the real problems, and then inspire your research. So that's how I work on it. Thanks. OK, so we've uh, typically been asking panels uh, to offer advice to, uh, to other researchers. I, I want to mix that up a little bit. And uh, given the, the audience you've got here, I think this is a chance for everyone to learn from you. So, so I want to ask you to reflect on some advice that you might be able to offer other researchers outside your own specialization uh, that comes from some kind of technical idea in your own field. So uh, you know, we're lucky that we have a really methodologically diverse panel here. So I think we have some reason to expect that you might have very different insights to offer. So I wonder, can you think of a, a cool technical idea, a recent breakthrough, a persistent challenge in your field that you think should be more broadly understood by the AI community and might, might be useful for people to understand? Uh, let's take this one in, uh, in random order, um, since I'm taking you by surprise. So uh, let's. Let's see if any of you have, uh, have something to say about this. Yeah. Go for it. Um, so in 20, end of 2018, uh, we created a data set called Conversational Question Answering. And with the hope that this is one of the most difficult data sets. Uh, so the, the task involves uh, you're given a paragraph, and then you're having a conversation with this machine. So uh, saying like, um, uh, uh, where is the CIFAR meeting happening, uh, Vancouver, and then uh, uh, w what else is, is there? Uh, what else is there means what else is there in Vancouver without having to specify uh, in Vancouver. And we thought like uh, this is one of the very challenging problems uh, because the machine has to understand not just language but also conversational history. Uh, and then uh, this model which everybody know, BERT came out. Uh, which is an unsupervised pre-training model where you're trying to predict uh, a missing word in the context. And uh, the human performance was around uh, uh, 88 or 90, and, and the models, uh, within, within a span of three months, we had best performing models at, the, at 88 to 90 again. And now the models are beating uh, human performance. So. Uh, it's fascinating that this model can just go through the whole text without even seeing what the world is. Uh, just like reading a lot of text and being able to do this task. So that fascinates me. What is that this model knows about the world without even seeing the world? Um, so that's one thing I wish uh, somebody has an answer to. Thanks very much. Uh, Adam, it looked like you had something to say as well. Yeah, so, so you're asking for like something we need to work on more, perhaps? Um, yeah, I guess I'm asking in particular for sort of a technical takeaway, something that, that you're excited about or that you think others might be able to, to build on or, or take something from. Well, I mean, I guess the first thing that jumped to mind is that, you know, one of the reasons we're all here is to, is to work on 
you know, generalizable learning systems, and I think that's one of the biggest limitations of current machine learning systems is that they don't know how to generalize. And so, specifically in the context of reinforced learning, you know, we have our Atari suite, we have games with paddles that you bounce balls off the paddles, and then if you train on one of those games, like Breakout, and then you go to Pong, it doesn't work. And so it's, it just seems like this is the biggest thing we need to work on, and it's, it's, it's just the eminent challenge right now. You're answering my next question. I, I, uh, did, Super. That was a fine answer, but for the rest of the panelists, I really want to, uh, in this question, hear about something that currently exists, that you know, your field is currently doing well, that you think might not be um, adequately understood outside your kind of narrow sub-area, particularly because maybe it's something very recent that you, know, you think it's interesting for the rest of the room to hear about. Uh, and Adam, if you want to uh, weigh in later on that as well, uh, feel free. But uh, um, in the meantime, Lily, did you, did you have something you wanted to say? Um, oh, I'm, I'm not sure whether I understand the question completely, but I think the thing really working well in NLP recently is the large-scale pre-trained model like BERT or GPT-2, whatever. So they are really working well, um, amazing performance in almost all NLP tasks. But then the problem is like the NLP research degrades to such a scenario that you just take in the model and you fine tune it a little bit and then you publish a new paper. So in this sense, I can publish infinite amount of paper because I can define infinite numbers of tasks and uh, create infinite numbers of data sets to do that. So I think um, th this is what is re working really well, but it looks like unsatisfactory scientific research then um, I think we shall be thinking about what is more scientific behind that. And uh, I think one of the main challenges in NLP is the modeling of semantics. So this is the question about uh, the question Randy asked in the morning. I can't find Randy. Where, where, where is Randy? OK. Anyhow, um, but this is the real challenge of NLP research. And uh, I think it should be addressed more in the future work. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I think um, I, I'd like to expand on this. So I don't know if I know of any very new things from my field that are applicable, but I know of some very old things. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I think, I, and I'm very impressed by these contextualized word embeddings. We're using them for everything uh, these days, but they still often fail to generalize in systematic ways. Uh, very simple permutations of argument structure, for instance, in sentences they can't detect uh, or they misgeneralize based on this. Now. On the linguistic side, of course, uh, we've had no theory of word meaning, uh, historically, of specific words, but we have a theory of glue for how word meaning is assembled into more complicated structures, like the meaning of sentences, discourses, et cetera. So a lot of these tools, I think, can be incorporated into deep learning systems, and are starting to be, in fact, across the board. So we have a bunch of projects on you know, using ideas about variable binding and logics and this kind of thing. In, with uh, in differentiable settings. Uh, but I think actually this, there could be much more of this. The, the uh, literature is a little bit unapproachable, um, uh, but I think <coughs> some of us are starting to form bridges, and this is where I see a lot of progress that could potentially be made. Thanks. Uh, I guess our two remaining speakers in the middle, one of you want to go? Uh, I would like to actually uh, follow up on what Adam was saying about generalization. So based on my experiences in uh, the domain of visual question answering, uh, we found that uh, we, the traditional paradigm is training and testing your models uh, on IID distributions. Um, but we tried uh, when you change the test distribution uh, while making sure that uh, the data, the input have sufficient information to be able to get to the answer, but it's just that the overall distribution looks different from training. Uh, models fail, um, and it's just that I would like to see more of out of distribution testing. Thank you. Um, okay, so I work uh, like in both recurrent neural networks and reinforcement learning. Uh, so my observation is um, like there has been like significant. Um, improvements in terms of designing better recurrent architectures, um, but in, if you consider reinforcement learning, like so, so we do a lot of research on the algorithmic sides of uh, reinforcement learning, uh, but I feel like there is a lot that could be done in the intersection of these two, like where like you take the architectural biases and introduce those to the algorithms. Like this is more like having explicit parameterization of your agents, uh, which is going to help us in like 
learning better, right? Like so, so instead of like having all the effort in the algorithmic side, like so, you can we can also ha like move away some efforts to the architectural bias of the algorithms. So. so it sounds like for the for the most part, you guys are thinking about um, sort of encoding past knowledge uh, in in richer ways, both about kind of semantic structures and about kind of algorithmic designs. Uh, sounds like you guys are very excited about contextual language models, but you feel like uh, their understanding is kind of superficial. Uh, and it sounds like elaboration tolerance is another kind of theme that, that came up across uh, what many of you guys had to say. Um, any other reactions uh, to that or to what, what you heard from the other panelists about this? Let's, let's move forward then to thinking uh, in a more future looking way. So, so let me ask you, um, five years from now, uh, what research challenges do you think that your fields uh, will have uh, substantially solved that they haven't solved today? And um, what um, new areas of focus do you think your fields will be aiming at um, you know, that are substantially different from the, the current focuses today? Um, and if uh, neither of those two questions uh, takes your fancy, let me give you one more, um, which is um, what, uh, what problems do you think will be de-emphasized by your fields? What, what possible blind alleys do you think that your field might, might recognize uh, you know, isn't worth the focus that's being given to it today? Um, once again, I'll, uh, I'll let you guys jump in unless, uh, unless nobody goes first. Um, I have some thoughts. So I think based on how the field is moving right now, uh, it feels like there is a lot of interest in moving from uh, supervised learning on static data sets to more interactive environments and also uh, towards uh, unsupervised learning. Um, so I think five years from now, uh, we are already hill climbing a lot on static data sets. Um, and five years from now, we would have very good performances on uh, standard benchmarks, and we would have, um, I think, also made some progress in interactive learning um, and unsupervised learning. I have some thoughts. Um, so I think in the last five to ten years, like we have made significant progress in like single task learning. So like and in, and very recently, like we have been looking a lot on the multitask learning setting. So so learning just one task from scratch uh, is like. I would not say it's solved, but like we have understood the problem decently, but there is not much understanding in a multitask setting. So this involves things like transfer learning or like meta learning or learning to learn. Um, uh, I would like I would expect to see a lot of progress uh, in these multitask settings in the next five years. So I think, um, as mentioned, one of the challenge in NLP is how to model the semantics or how to let the machine to do reasoning. And I think this could be uh, one of the breakthrough in maybe in the next few years. And the current approach I'm taking is to, do, to design a mechanism that allows the network to do symbolic reasoning. Just like as mentioned, if you want to do paragraphs, paragraph classification, you can say maybe the classification is based on this sentence or that sentence. Then the network has to be very, um, has to be very serious, like where is the evidence so that you can make the classification. And also uh, the example I mentioned is uh, synthetic reasoning for the sentence modeling. So current approach is very ad hoc. You see for each task, uh, we define the reasoning mechanism and, the, and let the model to do reasoning in, under this mechanism. But maybe in the future, we can have a more generic reasoning mechanism for different NLP um, tasks, uh, but in a more symbolic way than you just put a large black box machinery. That is good, especially for uh, industrial applications, but what is the scientific point behind that? So I think that could be some breakthroughs in the f uh, f next few years. Uh, I have one more thing. So one of the things we might solve, um, I'm, I'm guessing it's my, is uh, long uh, text understanding. So right now, uh, all, this, uh, all the conversation models or question answering models, given some uh, limited context, they can really do well. But like, uh, say I gave you a textbook and I asked you a random question from the textbook. Uh, can you still answer the question? Like, that's, we are not there yet, but my guess is we will be there. Uh, but wh where we won't, where we may not be there is, uh, can we make uh, models uh, be creative like humans? So that's uh, creativity requires even more 
intelligence. We might be able to mimic it and fool people, but I guess uh, it requires much more like something like telling a joke. Uh, okay. Um, I think we're going to probably be working less on games and simulators in, in five years. So, you know, the earlier panel, there was three people talking about advanced robotics. Hopefully that will be five or six in five years because I, I really think that's where things are going. I really think that's where the cutting edge of where our algorithms break down. I mean, you, you see this, there's been tons of gains in, in you know, online applications and video games and all kinds of things, but robotics still resists because things are non-stationary, um, it's really noisy, it's high dimensional, it's just really challenging problems to work on and I think, I think that's where we're gonna go. Um, yeah, so I actually, so I'm gonna say something a bit more sort of abstract here. Uh, I have the feeling that one of the problems we have with identifying uh, where our systems fail to be compositional uh, now is, is that we don't actually have a good operationalized <coughs> working definition of what compositionality means. So on one hand, we have like very classical systems that are you know, purely symbolic and combinatorial, uh, and we say it's something maybe kind of like that, but obviously this is not where natural language exactly lives in some sort of compositionality spectrum. And I, I've seen a couple, it, there's some work we're doing, and I've seen a couple of other threads that have emerged recently, some in uh, psycholinguistics, looking at uh, uh, representations of, say, dependency structure in terms of information theoretic quantities, and some interpretation of things like contextualized word embeddings in terms of similar quantities, that make me think that actually we're moving towards a place where we're gonna have a general sort of information theoretic way of measuring things like compositionality, and I think this is going to lead to, say, new kinds of regularization, new kinds of objectives uh, that let us pick the, the level of compositionality we want in a particular system reflect in a coding theoretic kind of way. Cool. Uh, any reflections on each other's uh, comments from the rest of you? You're such a sedate panel. You're supposed to be like, viciously disagreeing with each other. Um, if not, then let me, uh, let me ask you a question about Canada. So, so you've obviously uh, you know, all chosen to be uh, working in AI in Canada, uh, some of you um, spanning industry and academia. Um, what, uh, what, what do you think are the strengths and weaknesses of the Canadian AI system? What, uh, what, what has drawn you to Canada and what do you think is really working well here? And conversely, what do you think Canada should be focusing on to, to take it to the next level in, in the AI space? Let's, let's go backwards from, uh, from Adam on this okay. one. Yeah, so um, I can only really speak about, you know, Alberta and Amy because that's, that's where I am. But, you know, I, I went to school in the, the East Coast and I came to Alberta and it was, it was really obvious right away that it was an amazing place to be a student. There was, there was good research funding, there was amazing minds there, and, and it's just a, the best place in the world to be a student in reinforced learning, in my opinion. And then, you know, so I graduated and I went to the U.S. for a while and I just... I got a little bit of experience of what the funding model was like down there and, and how the student interaction worked. And it was very much students were assigned to big projects and then people felt very attached to students they had funded and students couldn't move around a lot. And, and also it was just the, the academic experience there just it wasn't the same. You know, I was just used to a room full of piercing questions and, and, and stimulating conversations. And so coming back, I also realized that it was also the best place in the world to be a researcher in reinforced learning, not just a student. And so, you know, that's kind of the strengths, you know, amazing students, amazing freedom to do research, great funding model. You know, the weaknesses are, you know, it's, it's uncertain climate right now, especially with climate change and with the way that the economy is going and there's, there's going to be a real hard push for us to deliver on a lot of the, the promises and the excitement in, in machine learning. And if we don't, we're not going to be immune here, right? So we, we do have to take this job seriously. We have to convince our funders. And we also just have to do a good job of showing that our research has value in the long run. OK, so um, I got my degrees in Peking University in China. And then I uh, worked as a postdoc in Waterloo with Pascal Poupart. Uh, is Pascal here? No? OK. So, so you uh, can say whatever you want. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, sorry? So, yeah. uh, <laughs> so uh, that's why I come to Canada and uh, I find uh, it's a really good place for, uh, for research. Um, 
also during my postdoc, you know, it's very flexible. Just just like as Adam mentioned, uh, I'm not, I was not bonded to any pro particular project. I can work with uh, whatever who I work want to work on or, or what I want to work on. And uh, um, and uh, then I joined UFA as a faculty member. Um, the funding model seems work well. Like uh, I have ad abundant funds, and also I can do. Uh, work on whatever I think important to NLP research or AI research. So that's why I think it's a great opportunity for me to stay here. Yeah. So I haven't tackled, uh, haven't realized all those challenges like the Canadian economic. Oh, I know I noticed something so um, bad. yeah. <laughs> um, one bad thing is the Alberta, you know, the situation is going worse. Like the government is cutting you mean the, the winter, right? <laughs> okay, yeah, it's kind of a winter, but um, yeah, so I'm not a citizen of PR, so I, uh, I, I just hold a work permit, like, uh, so I, I'm not too real, uh, realized about those things. I mean, to, to redirect this question a bit for everyone still to come, uh, many of you have experience in countries besides Canada, so it, it might also be uh, interesting to reflect on um, you know, the Canadian strengths and weakness in the context of the other systems that you've been part of. So compared with China, I think um, Canadian is, Canada obviously gives a more flexible way of doing research, like you can work on the real problem and uh, um, you don't have to count too many papers. And also you don't care too much about the values. I mean, obviously we publish good papers, but not specifically in the short list of like top tier conferences and it gives us a very good environment to do research that we really care about. Thanks. That's right. Hi. Uh, so in my case, like I did my PhD at the University of Montreal and Mila. So I liked the research environment there so much that like I decided to stay in Mila. Uh, so what I like about uh, research and like machine learning research in Montreal is, uh, is, 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 that, is that there is actually a very f fine line between um, like the research in industry and academia. Like, so there's a strong collaboration that exists between industry and academia, uh, which I think is like uh, a very unique uh, plus for, <laughs> for, for Mila. Um, apart from that, like, so, like, we have also developed this critical mass of machine learning researchers in these three institutes, which is kind of missing in several other places in different countries. Um, so, so this gives us like a really vibrant research environment to do like good machine learning research. Um, in terms of weakness, I would just say the Quebec immigration is not that friendly enough to attract more talents, so, so that's the weakness. <laughs> All right, so in terms of uh, things that are unique in Canada, I think uh, as Sarath was mentioning, it's the vibrant uh, ecosystem over there. Uh, great people, uh, great research directions being pursued, uh, a lot of support from government and institutions for long-term research, and as Surat pointed out, uh, something that I feel is a bit unique about Canada is this healthy collaborative ecosystem between uh, industries and universities. Um, uh, regarding the things that could be improved, uh, so I think uh, Canada already gets a lot of good students, but if uh, Maybe it can be pushed a bit more towards, like, if to compete with places like MIT, CMU. But I think that might already happen naturally uh, over a few years as more and more interesting research comes out of Canada. Thanks, Timothy. Um, well, let's see. I moved up here from the states about three years ago, and I'd have to say that the uh, the funding system up here is way easier and it's way better. I think it, it fosters a real diversity since more people, it's easier to get funding for in smaller amounts for more people. It really fosters a great, greater diversity of intellectual uh, progress and I think this is a really, really strong thing. In Montreal in particular right now, it's, there's just an overwhelming amount going on. So I moved, I was at MIT before. I think there's quite a bit more going on in Montreal right now than there. Um, uh, you know, it's the, by far the most intensity I've seen anywhere. Um, in terms of negatives, uh, I think that right now things are very chaotic. 
uh, because of all this growth, all this sudden growth right now. And so this is not necessarily necessarily a negative, but I think well, it remains to be seen how everything kind of settles down and what kinds of institutional structures can be built to sort of channel all this energy and, and you know, activity that's going on. Yeah. Thanks. All right, Siva, last week oh. to you. Yeah, uh, I did my PhD in the UK and uh, at Edinburgh, uh, and then I moved to po do postdoc at Stanford. Um, so comparing the academic scenario, like this is uh, Canada is new to me, but uh, even in my little experience, um, so I felt like UK has a very rigid academic structure, like really old Cambridge, uh, 1800 style probably, um, uh, and the salaries are terrible. <laughs> uh, and uh, coming to US, uh, uh, I find uh, uh, the research is really cutting edge. Um, uh, but then there is this like constant uh, fight for funding. Um, who also only few places get, might get all the funding. Um, so, uh, whereas in Canada, I really like that all my colleagues will get funding, including me. Um, <laughs> so uh, uh, even though it's little, I really like that. Um, Apart from that, I see the diversity here. Uh, other countries, uh, uh, right now, the political situation is not better. Like, I see a lot of uh, Iranians, a lot of Indians, a lot of uh, Pakistanis everywhere. That kind of communities here, whereas in the States, it's not that much. Um, but the most important thing that attracted me here is uh, uh, I visited all these universities and also McGill, but I went to Mila and uh, the ecosystem there, like that uh, was uh, uh, my final decision point, okay, I'm going, going to come here. The reason is like within uh, like 10 feet distance, you have all these companies. Um, and if you want to do public service, you could also work with government organizations. There are also a lot of Mila technology partners. Um, uh, and one bad thing uh, uh, that I could see is uh, for some reason, um, we are not able to retain the talent in this country. So I know that all these amazing um, PhD students are coming out of Mila, but like uh, the opportunities for them are not that many. Uh, even in the case of uh, my spouse or anything, uh, we are finding it hard to uh, like she's highly qualified, but even then, like uh, it's hard to find a job compared to US. Tell her to apply to UBC. <laughs> So, so overall, it sounds like you guys, uh, you know, in addition to comments we've heard from the other panels, you guys are particularly emphasizing uh, the freedom from sort of bean counting constraints about research productivity and kind of collegiality within your departments as um, key uh, attractors here. Um, th thanks for a, an informative and entertaining panel. I think we have a few minutes to hear uh, any questions from the audience that uh, people in the room might have. Uh, let me give a, a moment for people to make it to the microphones if, uh, if they're going to do that. Yeah, please. Hi. Yes. Um, thanks for the discussion. So um, we talked a little bit about uh, multitask learning earlier. And um, I guess there's two ways to learn a large amount of tasks. Uh, you can either learn them sequentially, like us humans we do, or you can learn them uh, simultaneously, just like we're doing right now in ML. Um, so I guess my question is, uh, with the former, the problem is, you need to relax the stationary distribution assumption. And with the latter, it just seems impractical to learn a huge amount of tasks at the same time. So I'm wondering where we should spend uh, our energy. We don't need five people, to, uh, six people to answer this, but maybe two or three of you, if you have something targeted to say, yeah, go I can, ahead. I can start. Um, um, I, th I, think we, like, I think both these settings are valuable, right? Like, so, so it's not like one is better than the other and we should not spend time on the other setting. Um, so especially like let's say you have a situation where you know all the tasks like beforehand and like you have data for training on all these tasks, then training simultaneously like uh, has been shown to be uh, a better approach because there is no catastrophic forgetting and like you can just train a bigger model uh, with all the tasks and um, like, as long as there is no uh, conflicting uh, information between these tasks, like you are going to learn a better multitask agent. Um, but there are also situations where, like, you want to continually learn, like where you have, you might 
start with five tasks, but then like if you want to add a sixth task in the future, like so how would you add a new task, right? Like so so these this, these settings also arise. Like so so I think we should focus on both the settings. Yes, yeah, so this is a really interesting question. So obviously some things are sequential in nature, right? Like I don't learn to hunt before I learn how to walk. Like that's, that's, that's a weird order. But we should also imagine that our learning systems can have many, many goals and can think about many, many things at once. And so in reinforced learning, we typically call that off-policy learning where you do one thing and you learn about many things at once. So you need something like options to, to do that um, or temporal abstraction. But the other thing is to think about planning with a, a model of the world, right? With the model of the world, the agent can sit there and it can imagine many, many future scenarios it could be in and update its policies for, for different situations. And so, yes, there's going to be things that are sequential just by the nature of interaction with the world, but we do want to care about computational efficiency such that we can leverage any kind of parallelism that we can. Thanks. Uh, let's take another question now. Uh, okay, thanks very much for this great discussion. Um, I just have a question regarding the future direction in machine learning. So I expect to have like um, more about understanding deeply what does machine learning or how does machine learning work because, because most of our algorithms can be considered as like a black box. We don't understand like um, clearly what happens inside this black box. Uh, which like uh, avoid a lot of people to deploy machine learning because we can't have like real guarantees when deploy uh, machine learning in like um, uh, critical applications like surgery or robotics or whatever, um, which have make some people claim that maybe machine learning will be trendy for a few years and then it will disappear because we can't have some sort of guarantees for real application. So I would like to hear from you, do you expect like in the near future we will be able to understand um, how the machine learning works and how, why this algorithm works better than the other or like I need to hear your comment about this. It's a great question, who's uh, willing to take I, a stab? I think um, for example if you want to do sentence modeling or paragraph modeling and you focus on symbolic reasoning underlying your understanding quest, uh, problem, then it's kind of uh, explainability, right? But it's not the really explain the machine learning model, but it's explain the task. The task can be decomposed into several subtasks and based on the output of this subtask and then based on the output of the other subtask and then you would eventually do the ultimate classification as like this. Um, so I think this is one aspect, but not really the uh, explanation of uh, the machine learning model itself. Yeah, so I think this is my partial answer. Any other thoughts about the road to explainability? Uh, yeah, this question, uh, this is something which I constantly think about. Well, in the past, uh, when we used linguistic representations uh, or linguistically inspired representations, mm -hmm. uh, there used to be a, a component of explainability. We know what the model is able to do. But uh, in the deep learning world, we lost that. But uh, my hunch is that if we combine deep learning with reinforcement learning uh, as some kind of, if you are also inducing intermediate representations uh, that can tell you something about the model, um, we might be able to fix that problem. Um, but, uh, I, I'm not so sure yet. But we, it's not, uh, we cannot guarantee the output. That's, yeah, that's I think there. this will be the main issue. If we can't guarantee the output, so how can we deploy the machine learning in real application and like let people use it, right? Right, right. Um, that, that's a problem. Yeah. Uh, I just want to emphasize the reverse of your question. Sometimes we humans don't uh, have an explanation and then we do the decision. Sometimes we do the decision and then you ask why. Okay, this is my reason, you see. If I do the other decision and then I can also look for those reasons. So I don't think we must have an explanation, although sometimes it could help the decision. Uh, so I think we have one other very patient questioner. Alyssa, do we, uh, do we have time for one more question? Yeah, let's, uh, let's end with this one then. Thanks. Thank you. Um, my question is very related. Um, I was very glad to hear that compositionality is seen as an important thing, and I think that it relates a lot to explainability. So my question is not whether this is important, but maybe how can we change the CS, machine learning, stats, and so on, education, such that 
the mathematical theories, let's say, that allow us to talk and construct and prove things about compositional systems are more present in the toolkit of the practitioners and, and algorithm designers, because my suspicion is that we need more of that stuff, and it probably is not all the stuff that we already teach. So, so your question is about how teaching should be uh, modified to take these issues into account? Yes, with, with correlated to what kind of mathematical toolings we might have to, represent, to be represented more. Great question. Okay, who, uh, who wants to go for it? There's a couple of you we haven't heard from in the questions yet, so you know I'm, you know I'm looking at you. Um, so that's a tough question. Uh, I'm teaching a course next semester. Uh, <laughs> There's still time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I mean, so uh, obviously the, the field is uh, groaning under the sheer amount of technical knowledge that you need to understand any corner of it. Um, so I think it's really, really actually a hard question because if you need to understand uh, how to do automatic differentiation as well as uh, how to, you know, prove compactness for logic, that's a, a huge amount to ask of anybody. Uh, so maybe, maybe the answer has to do with uh, more flexibility in uh, core curricula for people in AI and machine learning students. I mean, I sort of have this issue in, uh, in the linguistics department. We're developing a program uh, in computational linguistics. And of course, I'd like my students to know everything in deep learning and lambda calculi and formal logics. Uh, but that's not really a plausible uh, uh, you know, track. But maybe uh, what we need to be thinking about is ways for people to piece together programs that have specializations in two or three more diverse areas than we currently see. Somebody want to take the last word on how we should uh, respond educationally to breakthroughs in ML? Go for it. Um, yeah, so I'm a, I'm a little bit resistant to think about changing the CS curriculum because when you add something in, you have to take things out. And already CS is kind of this field that's not super well defined and it's not really clear what it really is a CS program is supposed to be about. So it's always good to question what it's about, but I think these, these cross-discipline collaborations are probably the way, right way to go for these kind of questions rather than changing the program itself because, you know, every year we're going to think of something new. It's like, well, the students just knew this thing. Let's like stuff it in there somewhere else and soon we'll, we'll be missing a lot. Steve, did you have something you were, you were burning to say or should we leave it there? Uh -huh. I'll probably leave it there. I did not teach anything yet, so... <laughs> so you can report back next time. Yes. All right, well, let's thank all of our panelists again.